Woohoo! Oh, wow. It worked. The music stopped and. <laughs> good morning, good morning on this delightful day. Welcome to United Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is David Kramer, minister here at this church. Helping with today's service, we have Jamie DeWicky as our guest musician. <laughs> yeah. And Stuart, Stuart Kearns will help us out in a little bit, and of course Aaron Hurwitz on, is our tech today. A few things to lift up before we begin. So today is the Pride Parade downtown in Milwaukee. Starts at 2 o'clock. We need to be lined up by quarter to 2. So if, you've, if you're not already planning on doing this, but you can join in, um, maybe see Meg and Monty right in the front here to work on carpools or something about that. There we go. <laughs> Tomorrow we will hold our annual blood drive, and so if you are if you are not signed up already but willing to help set up, uh, that would be great, uh, and also willing to to donate blood, that would be great as well. Ellen tells me that uh, uh, that now there's a whole uh, a group of medications. For, uh, for giving blood. So if you have not been able to give blood in the past, check it out. You might be able to do it again. Out on the ledge is a sign-up sheet for greeters. We need greeters. Right at the moment, we are a little low. So please uh, add your name to the greeters list out there. It's really important. We have several visitors and guests today, and we need people to welcome them in and make sure that, um, that uh, they're set. On Friday, there will be a memorial service for Edna Pfeiffer, who died on May 28th. Um, the visitation will begin at 4 o'clock, and we will have a short service that begins at 5.15. And then the next day, on Saturday the 10th, the... Um, is it the Spring City Spinners? The bicycle club that, uh, that uh, Edna had belonged to is organizing a bike ride on the Glacial Drumlin Trail starting at the EB Shirts Center. They're kicking off at 7.30 a.m. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> I'll be riding, half asleep, but uh, uh, if, uh, if you would wish to join in, please do so uh, for that ride. Sorry, there's a lot going on. Last, was it just last Saturday, um, Rusty Armstrong was down at the farmer's market. We have a booth set at the farmer's market once a month through the summertime, and uh, uh, he, had, he had a great reception. We gave out rainbow pins and Black Lives Matter pins, and people lined up, and uh, uh, it, was, it was a good, good showing. The next time we will be at the farmer's market will be on the 24th, and right now, Sarah Fukar is set to lead that. She needs help. It really takes two people at least to do this. So if you are willing to help out with, uh, with Sarah, we have a pop-up tent, we have all the swag we need and a table and all of that stuff. Uh, but, uh, but please, if you are willing to be down at the farmer's market, contact um, Sarah uh, sometime before the 24th. Next week is our annual meeting following the worship service. The week after that is Flower Communion. This is a, uh, we will have special music. The choir is working hard on a cantata and some additional music. Uh, it is the 100th anniversary of the Flower Communion, so it's a kind of a big deal. Bring a flower. And this week, our theme is delight. And I'm just delighted that you are all here today on this delightful day. With that, Molly... Can you give me a hand? Let's center yourselves for worship by lighting our chalice with words we share each week. May this flame kindle within us the warmth of compassion the glow of love, the fire of commitment, and the light of truth. Here together we scatter and nurture seeds of spirit, service, and community. So our first hymn is number 291 in the gray hymnal, or here on the wall, Die Gedanken sind frei. Die Gedanken sind frei. 
Please rise in body or spirit. sing that one too often. I kind of like it. <laughs> Each week we share in the life of this congregation by sharing joys and sorrows, milestones in our individual lives. If you have something to share, I would invite you to come forward to the microphone, take a stone from the bowl, hold it in your hand while you speak. Tell us your name, please, as well. And when you are finished, place the stone in the bowl with the water to let the ripples carry your concerns out to the wider community. two pulpits to work with today, so I'm taking advantage. <laughs> and I have a story. This one, I bet you know. This is Henry Hikes to Fitchburg. It works pretty well, I think, on a nice spring day like today. One summer day, Henry and his friend decided to go to Fitchburg to see the country. I'll walk, said Henry. It's the fastest way to travel. I'll work, Henry's friend said, until I have the money to buy a ticket to ride the train to Fitchburg. We'll see who gets there first. His friend waved, enjoy your walk, he said. Henry walked down the road to Fitchburg. Enjoy your work, he called back. Henry's friend filled the wood box in Mrs. Alcott's kitchen, 10 cents. Henry hopped from rock to rock across the Sudbury River. His friend swept out the post office, five cents. Henry carved a walking stick, miles to Fitchburg. His friend pulled all the weeds in Mr. Hawthorne's garden, 15 cents. Henry put ferns and flowers in a book and pressed them. His friend painted the fence in front of the courthouse, 10 cents. Henry walked on stone walls. Henry's friend moved the bookcases in Mr. Emerson's study, 15 cents. Henry climbed a tree, 18 miles to Fitchburg, his friend carried water to the cows grazing on the grass in town, five cents. Henry made a raft and paddled up the Nashua River. Henry's friend cleaned out Mrs. Thoreau's chicken house, 10 cents. Henry crossed a swamp and found a bird's nest in the grass, 
12 miles to Fitchburg. His friend carried flour from the mill to the village baker, 20 cents. Henry found a honey tree. Henry's friend ran to the train station to buy his ticket to Fitchburg, 90 cents. Henry jumped into a pond, seven miles to Fitchburg. His friend sat on the train in a tangle of people. Henry ate his way through a blackberry patch. Henry's friend got off the train at Fitchburg Station just as the sun was setting. Henry took a shortcut, one mile to Fitchburg. His friend was sitting in the moonlight when Henry arrived. The train was faster, he said. Henry took a small pail from his pack. I know, he smiled. I stopped for blackberries. And that's my story. As you can tell, probably that's, a, that's roughly based on Henry David Thoreau and some values that, uh, that may or may not have been brought to the table by that guy. Molly, do you want to stay with us out with Lily and Adia? Okay, let's sing then. <laughs> Shift gears, settle in, breathe together in this space in a spirit of meditation and prayer. This spring has seemed to me to be extra delightful. I don't know why, but the, the blossoms that, um, that burst forth about a month ago uh, were just spectacular. And then they all fell on the path down by the river and carpeted the whole way. And I have just been enjoying the weather and the return of the birds and the bird song and Today, especially with a little cooler temperatures, um, the weather. Edna Pfeiffer, for her memorial service, has requested a poem that I will read again on Friday, but I thought that I might share it today uh, in, for it's beautiful. It is by Edna St. Vincent Millay, and I think is poignant in this time. O world, I cannot hold thee close enough. Thy winds, thy wide gray skies, thy mists that roll and rise. Thy woods this autumn day that ache and sag and all but cry with color. That gaunt crag to crush, to lift the lean of that black bluff. World, world, I cannot get thee close enough. Long have I known a glory in it all, but never knew I this, here such a passion is, as stretch, stretcheth, stretcheth me apart. Lord, I do fear thou'st made the world too beautiful this year. My soul is all but out of me. Let fall no burning leaf, prithee let no bird call. 
Let's sing together, we give thanks. You may remain seated for this. invite Stuart Kearns to come up and share his delightful journey with us. Shrimp and grits. Um, I really wasn't sure why David asked me to do this, why I was the one he, he felt was qualified. I didn't, I didn't come to being a foodie very easily because when I was growing up, my mom was a pretty bad cook. But I didn't know that until I was in my early 20s. Her method of cooking was everything was cooked to well done. Because that's the way my dad liked it. Meats, vegetables, everything. Her one saving point was that she used lots of garlic. Not the fresh variety, but in the powder. It was seasoning. And no pepper. Yeah, that made her ulcer dance, so anything spicy was off the table. You know, years later, after I started medical school, I could never convince her that avoidance of spice had nothing to do with her ulcer, but that's another story. And that's not to say I didn't eat well. She made an excellent chicken soup, a wonderful carb-loaded noodle kugel, and a killer brisket. But Jewish cooking was not gourmet cuisine. Think the opening scenes to Billy Crystal's Mr. Saturday Night. If you don't know in one word, schmaltz. <laughs> I thus led a food-sheltered life. I was in my early 20s before I could bring myself to try blue cheese. Why would anyone put anything moldy in their mouths? First in the form of salad dressing and onward to the real deal, and within weeks, it became one of my favorite cheeses. Still is. While working at the University of Chicago, I was exposed to various ethnic foods. Began to expand my tasting menu. We had a Korean gentleman who introduced me to his country's cuisine, and a doctoral student who was raised in Hong Kong, who would often take us on field trips into Chicago's Chinatown. We never knew what we were getting. Bill would offer it, order off the menu in Mandarin, but everything was great. I moved to California at the end of the 70s, and I was astonished at what passed for great pizza there. Really fresh and inexpensive produce, but the pizza? Ugh. Having lived in the Chicago area for my entire life at that point, and the home of some of the best pizza in the country, sorry, New York, I used the experience gained while working at a pizza place in college. I took it upon myself to duplicate the famous Chicago-style stuffed pizza so that I could show my friends what a good pizza should taste like. After visiting back home and carefully observing the construction of the Giordano's pizza and tasting it with a critical eye, I experimented with the dough. I adjusted the sauce recipe. I even altered the local breakfast sausage to morph into Italian sausage. And after several tries, I was successful. Pizza parties became a regular event a few times a year. I was hooked. After moving back to Chicago, I availed myself of the range of ethnic restaurants the city offered. Greek, Thai, Indian, Caribbean, Iranian, Vietnamese, all of these choices were within a mile or so of where we lived. And Paula, my soon-to-be wife, was my partner in crime, indulging ourselves in food cultures, always ready to try something new that we'd never heard of before. When we moved to Waukesha in 1990, we found ourselves in culture shock. <laughs> Barely an ethnic restaurant to be found. We cultivated favorite restaurants, then 
few and far between, to assuage our culinary needs and desires. And thankfully, that's become much easier since we first moved here. Paula loves to travel, and under this guise, led us to food expeditions. We went to Italy and, of course, found it delicious. Our sightseeing was arranged around bistros and restaurants we wanted to try, and we were never disappointed. Some of the best places, some of the best foods were in places that you could only find if you were completely lost. And the best places to eat were down what we in the United States would call an alley. No, really, an alley. We started traveling with two other couples to France, Mexico, the southeast coast of the U.S. The beauty was that our friends also shared love of food. Traveling and food made us perfect bedfellows. And don't let anyone ever tell you that the food in Great Britain is, is bad. It isn't. They're an edible melting pot of so many different cultures. The sun never sets on the British Empire. Well, these days it does. But the Brits brought back all the foods from all those faraway lands. Then there was a time that Paula and Karen, one of her closest friends, took a cooking class in Milwaukee. She claimed it was really inexpensive. It's a special price to, to fill the class up. The chef, Fabrizio Toscalanza, was promoting her cookbook and told them stories of Sicily and the foods. And Paula came home with this conspiratorial smile on her face, convinced we had to go to the chef's cooking school in Sicily. <laughs> yeah, cheap, inexpensive class. But we went, and there we learned to make some plastic pastas. Fabrizia says the Sicilians don't add egg to their pasta because their flour is so much better than the rest of Italy. We traveled to the largest fish market on the island in the shadow of Mount Etna, ate classic Sicilian dishes, watched and made Neapolitan-style pizzas. The secrets are a really hot oven. The dough used genuine Italian flour and a very light touch. Everywhere we went, there was food, all of it amazing, and all of, us pushed, all of this pushed us even further along our current culinary preparations. After a trip that took us to South Carolina and, of course, tasting local favorites, I was determined to learn to make shrimp and grits. I used my solo time, my work trips to Las Vegas gave me, to work on getting the grits just right. I ate grits three or four nights in a row tweaking the amount of water, the salt, the cheese, just to get it right. And that was just the grits part of it. All of the, the, result, the results of all of these experiences was the ability to offer the different auction items that we've done over the years. Greek feast, deep dish stuffed pizza, then thin crust, southern shrimp and grits. And some months ago, I finally took it upon myself to make croissant. Surprisingly, I found them relatively easy, so who knows? maybe a French dinner for the auction in the future. And I haven't even touched upon my love of chocolate. One taste I acquired from my mom, though she leaned towards milk chocolate, and I'm exclusively dark. I'm not at the point where I want to produce my own chocolate, though I can describe in detail from start to finish how it's done, from bean harvest to bar. Every trip included chocolate in some way, shape, or form, and if you ever want to see me smile, and get a faraway look in my eyes, just mention the dessert selection we first discovered in the Rhone Valley in France, Café Gourmand. It's not really a selection, but it's a cup of coffee, and that means espresso, nearly everywhere in France or Italy, with the selection of all the desserts on the menu that night, just a couple of bites of each. And a hot chocolate at Café Wavoir in Florence, Italy, a near transcendental experience for chocolate lovers. And all the cooking that we've done made me realize that a good knife edge went hand in hand with meal prep. And so on I went to learn how to best sharpen a knife. Hint, I followed a YouTube video on the Japanese method of creating an excellent edge that some of you, who I hope still have all your fingers, have also experienced. Ask me, I'll share the link. While I'm happy with my results, it's still a learning experience. The end result of all these experiences is that traveling, eating, and simple curiosity, coupled with a desire to just want to learn, can lead us down a road that will be rewarding, informative, and delicious.
Thank you, Stuart. Wow, blue cheese and shrimp and grits. When I was putting together this service, I knew that, that uh, uh, well, I wanted Stuart to talk about his journey to shrimp and grits, and that showed up on the order of service, and Jamie picked up on that and said, oh, is there a fish theme to this, to this service? And I said, yeah, go with it, and, uh, and I would build on that, and as it came together, eh, not so much, but Jerry, Jamie has, if you note your order of service, Jamie has chosen three pieces with fish themes and in fact is uh, adorned in a fish dress today. So <laughs> as we receive our offering, as we do each week, please enjoy Jamie's offering of fish. <laughs> So, again, as our theme this month is delight, my first thought was the Epicureans, those ancient Greeks. We understand now as having a refined taste in food. Epicurean meaning a refined taste in food. And that made me think of Stuart, who has delighted so many with his tastes and his skills. And so you have been treated today with Stuart's shrimp and grits story, along with knife sharpening and pizza and blue cheese. And I especially like the, um, did you say you are experimenting now with croissants? Yes. So in our Soul Matters packet this week, you might note that uh, one of the delights that the author here has, uh, have, has elucidated is that first bite of a perfectly made croissant proving that decadence sometimes purifies the soul. But this understanding of Epicureanism as cultured and refined is relatively new. Not so long ago, and for a very long time, Epicureans were the bad boys of the ancient Greeks, characterized as gluttons and drunks and totally driven by the pursuit of raw pleasure. They were seen as selfish, ignoble. In our minds, they stand against those, that other school of thought from Greece, the Stoics, whom we say we more admire, perhaps, whom we aspire to be. Like Thoreau, right, from Henry Hikes to Fitchburg, we see Henry as a stoic, even if we know he regularly hiked barely a mile into town from Walden Pond to have his mom do his laundry and bake him cookies, especially in our current understanding of Epicureanism, as refined taste, we don't see him so much that way, chowing down on a woodchuck. Thoreau and Emerson, as part of the first definable intellectual movement in the new United States, helped shape the archetypes that underpin our social mythos. So we see ourselves as more stoic, less Epicurean. But then there are those blackberries. But all of this is far from Epicurus, the actual Greek and what he taught. Epicurus was born in 341 BC. He began his teaching career at about age 30, same as Jesus. Platonism was the dominant philosophy at the time, but Epicurus saw it differently. Just about everything he taught was the opposite of what Plato was saying. 
That got him kicked out of some towns. But in others, he came to have great influence. In fact, Epicureanism is one of the four major schools of thought to come out of ancient Greek, the others being Platonism, Aristotelianism, and Stoicism. Epicurus starts with a question. Where can I find true happiness? Or in Greek, ataraxia, which is a state of being completely free from pain or mental anguish, a state of untroubledness. You get there by letting go of fear, he says, fear of God, and especially fear of death. He was a materialist who thought that the universe was made up of infinite and infinite number of infinitesimally small particles he called atoms, go figure, which means parts that cannot be divided, and that everything everywhere was simply one combination of atoms or another. He was a hedonist in that he believed that which is morally good is pleasurable and that which is morally bad is painful. But his ethics are not all about what we have come to understand as hedonism. This is not if it feels good, do it. It's more like if you do it and it feels right, go with that. He believed in free will. He did not believe that the gods punish people or have anything to do with the affairs of humans at all. And he believed that the soul and the body are one thing, which means that when you die, that's it. Your atoms just disassemble and go on to form something else. He was not very political, teaching that the good life comes in obscurity, not in seeking power. Knowledge is real power, he says. And much of his teaching occurred in a school called the Garden, established on a plot of land he owned in Athens, which was apparently not far from the Academy and the Stoa, two other philosophical schools. And in contrast to the other schools, the Garden openly invited women and enslaved people to, to study there as a matter of policy. There's a group called the pursuitofhappiness.org, which describes itself as a group of psychologists, philosophers, educators, and web professionals dedicated to the advancement of scientific knowledge about happiness and depre depression prevention. They write this about Epicurus. Imagine, if you will, a lush garden full of fresh fruits and vegetables. Robed figures pass to and fro along the paths, stopping now and then to engage one another in pleasant conversation on science, philosophy, and art. In one corner, a minstrel plays harmonious chords on his lyre. In another, there is a discussion on free will. The teacher explains that there is no reason to fear the gods and that human beings have complete freedom to choose their own path in life and to obtain happiness in the here and now. A cool wind blows as one breathes in the Mediterranean ocean air amidst the beauty of nature and the fellowship of friends and family. If you have imagined all of this, you have imagined Epicurus's pleasure garden, a place where he and his students would congregate in the pursuit of achieving the most pleasant life possible in this world. Epicurus posed what is now called the Epicurean paradox. God, he says, either wishes to take away evils or he is unable, or he is able and unwilling or he is neither willing nor able, or he is both willing and able. If he is willing and unable, he is feeble and not in accordance with the character of God. If he is able and unwilling, he is envious, which is equally at variance with the character of God. If he is neither willing nor able, he is both envious and feeble and therefore not God. If he is both willing and able, which alone is suitable to God, from what source then are evils? Or why does he not remove them? 
In contrast to the mischaracterization of Epicurus as a glutton, he writes, the pleasant life is not produced, is produced not by a string of drinking bouts and revelries, nor by the enjoyment of sexual intercourse, nor by fish, fish, and other items on an expensive menu, but by sober reasoning. Drinking causes hangovers. Deception causes guilt. If you really want to be happy, don't do those things. He also wrote that a single piece of good cheese, probably blue cheese, could be as pleasing as a feast. And because Epicurus did not believe in the mortality of the soul, he believed it died along with the body. The Epicureans who followed him became famous for saying, death means nothing to us, literally. There is an epitaph attributed to the Epicureans that Wikipedia says is engraved on many Greek tombstones and now often used in humanist memorial services, though I had not heard it before. It goes, non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. I was not, I was, I am not, I do not care. <laughs> the three other schools of Greek thought, which were far more militaristic, did not think much of the Epicureans hanging out in their garden, which was maybe the start of the idea that Epicureanism is bad, but then things really got worse with the rise of Christianity. As Christian doctrine was hammered out in the fourth century, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, church fathers went looking for some intellectual support in Greek theology and found things they could borrow from the other three schools, but they found nothing close to what they were thinking in Epicureanism. So, in good church fashion, they vilified whatever it is that they could not understand. And maybe worse, they just stopped rewriting, transcribing Epicurus's work so that over time, nearly all of it has been lost. All this history you can find pretty quickly in an internet search. What I think is significant for us is that it puts Epicurus right there in line with the heroes of Unitarian and Universalism. He's the heretic among the Greeks. He's the inclusive one on the side of women and enslaved people. He believes in study and in reason. He wants peace. I think that the values that Epicurus brings to the table, in contrast to the values of the other Greek schools of thought, might help us understand the underpinnings of our own supposed cultural divide and why it's so hard to talk to someone from the other side. Epicurus was a believer in free will and as a foil to Plato, an anti-authoritarian. His whole project was about how independent, self-sufficient people can find purpose in their lives and how deeply satisfying that can be. Authoritarianism, on the other hand, requires obedience, and obedience negates free will. It stands against the freedom to make practical judgments about your own life, for example, in deference to authority. Adrienne Marie Brown is a contemporary writer who describes herself as a pleasure activist. Pleasure, as Brown understands it, seems to be much like Epicurus understood it, as an individual right and a measure of our lives. We don't say, don't, we, we say, don't we? We believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everybody, for themselves, but Pleasure, Brown says, is actually repressed in our current culture, which leads to all kinds of spin-off repressions and oppressions, especially including the denial of the pleasure of being exactly who you are. As we begin Pride Month, the ancient conflict among the Platonists and the Stoics and the Epicureans might cast some light on our present situation. What is right and good, and how do we know it? Epicurus would say, you know it, in your gut, in your heart. Our Soul Matters packet this month invites us to consider 
all the delights of our lives, to make a list, put them in a box, as it were, and haul them out from time to time as an antidote to the loneliness and the struggle. I think Epicurus actually invites us into something deeper, into a state of constant untroubledness. I think this is not to deny the injustice, the pain of the world, but to show where it comes from and how it might be fixed. I think the Soul Matters folks hooked into something they didn't quite realize. Delight is not just an antidote. Delight is anti-shame. Delight is God as pure love. Delight is the delight in friendship and in dialogue, in the connection between us. Delight is shrimp and grits. Delight is this congregation. Delight is us. Let's sing together once again. This last hymn is another one that might challenge us a little bit. It is a Harry Belafonte tune, and so it's going to be syncopated. There are going to be repeats. You can follow along on the wall. Please rise and body your spirit. We're going to do this as well as we can. no idea how to do that last part. <laughs> so in reading to prepare for today, I came upon a thesis that argues that 17th century rationalist Baruch Spinoza was an ep Epicurean. This is a really long and esoteric paper that shaped this service significantly, though I did not use any parts directly in it. 
But it also led to a piece called The God of Spinoza, which is not scholarly and is likely completely made up and cut and pasted across the internet. I could not find the original author anywhere, but it's everywhere. And it broadly characterizes Spinoza's theology and Epicureanism and maybe even Unitarian Universalism as well. God would say, according to the Epicurean Spinoza, Stop praying and giving yourself blows on your chests. What I want you to do is to go out into the world to enjoy your life. I want you to enjoy, to sing, have fun, enjoy everything I've done for you. Stop going to those gloomy, dark, and cold temples that you built for yourselves and that you call my home. My home is in the mountain in the forests, the, the rivers, the lakes, and the beaches. That's where I live and express all my love to you. Stop blaming me for your miserable life. I never told you you were a sinner. Stop being so scared. I do not judge you, nor criticize you, nor ever am angry with you. Nothing bothers me, nor do I devise punishment. I am pure love. Stop asking me for forgiveness. There's nothing to forgive. If I made you, I filled you with passions, limitations, pleasures, feelings, needs, inconsistencies, free will. How can I blame you if you do or say something out of that which I put in you? How can I punish you for being as you are if I'm the one who made you? Do you think I could create a place to burn all my children who misbehave for the rest of eternity? What kind of God can do that? Forget about any kind of commandments, any kind of laws. Those are wiles to manipulate you, to control you, and only to create guilt in you. Respect your peers and don't do to others what you don't want for you. The only thing I ask is that you pay attention in your life, that your alert status is your guide. This life is the only thing there is, here and now, and the only thing you need. Blessed be.